So you mentioned you were at Apple's Innovation Lab. I mean, Apple strikes me, at least during the Jobs era, maybe maybe even still, but like more than most companies willing to to innovate and even at the risk of cannibalizing their own business. Like I think, you know, they took a big risk when they released the iPad, mm -hmm. knowing full well that it was going to eat into MacBook sales. I'm curious, like when you were there, like what were your kind of main takeaways if you can talk about them at some level? Yeah. No, yeah, I definitely can. So, so the company I was working at, we were in the hospitality space. And so Apple specifically and why we got invited, they were looking to they bring their, their, their technology into hotels and things like that. Um, and so, so we got to work with their innovation team. And I think what they did that was so interesting is, is their innovation teams are actually, because you have the big, cool, you know, Apple Park, none of their innovation teams actually are in Apple Park. They're all off campus. What they had that was interesting, and I don't know if this is the right way or the wrong way, um, but it, it's, it's worked for them. Those innovation teams didn't have a, um, a p &L, like in any real way. It was very much your job is to come up with the next new cool thing. Uh, and and when you're Apple, you can do this. You can say, you know, cost to be damned uh, because yeah. you're Apple and you have a giant war chest. But that was their approach. It's like, we're, and their their teams are huge. They actually have five different innovation labs um, that focus on different verticals. That they're, each innovation lab focuses on a different vertical. Those labs, they, they have budgets, but they don't have any expectation of generating revenue because I think they're really good at understanding that we need to be thinking five years down the road. We need to be thinking 10 years down the road. These people aren't going to be the people that are going to hit our bottom line this year. And I think whenever you get short-sighted like that, when you start thinking like, what's the cool thing that you all are going to launch that's going to move the number next year, you start thinking about it in the wrong way. And I think that's one thing that Apple did really good. It's like, we don't have any expectation. Our, what we want to do is we want you to bring something to our meeting. They, they, they had to come present to senior execs once a quarter. We yeah. want you to bring, bring something to our meeting that's going to blow our minds. Uh, that's going to make us go, oh, wow, that's super cool. And and I thought, there, and one I think that was actually on the walls is present something cool. And that, that was kind of their, their mission. I think doing that put them down a, a path that that allows them to continue to innovate and come up with things that that are just different than what yeah it's kind of it's kind of like the old almost the old school um pre like google 20 percent idea you know approach to innovation where you had a somewhat segregated r d lab where you know you hire a bunch of big wigs and you kind of can contemplate out i, I remember my first job out of grad school was at a at one of these kind of R and D labs, it was one of the first AI labs um, back then. In it, it was kind of tucked inside of a giant telco, and because of a monopoly, you know, we were able to to basically have this mandate to just do whatever the heck we wanted. I mean, the, we had some rules. This was, uh, I think, we had a few rules. Like one of them was like no hardware. <laughs> like, so they'd moved everything to software. Like at one point, and that was like a big big decision for them. But other than that, I remember having the most bizarre mandate meetings. Like when I first started, I was like, so wait, what am I working on? They're like, whatever you feel like it. I'm like, what's my budget? And they're like, well, you get 80 grand to buy whatever you want, which, you know, it's like 1995 or something. I said, okay, but they said, but you can't spend more than 3000 on at one blow. So everyone was like incrementally constructing like these, you know, like their, their hardware devices and everything. But I remember part of it was that, you know, we also, this was really early days of the internet. We were also like utterly convinced the internet was this massive deal. And I remember having the most weird conversations with executives, you know, and we were trying to like let them know, hey, like the internet's a big deal. Like everything's going to, this whole business is going to be radically transformed. Like you got to, you know, change onto this, that, and the other. And and then meanwhile, we'd like give them access to, we had a, just a ton of stuff that's all, you know, become startups that are huge that we don't even think about as a big deal anymore. But, you know, you can pick anything, pick search, whatever. Mm -hmm. And we'd put them in front of a browser. And then we finally realized that, and we're like, God, why, why does this guy keep coming to web pages and just never clicks on anything like never found, never right. he just never just didn't know what to do takeaway was like oh we need to make a smartphone to me I like my takeaway was like this is going to be a really tough place to, to actually drive innovation because the model's broken like what needs to happen is anyone in this lab that wants to take this thing forward should be able to walk down raise money get a couple of million bucks and then buy their freedom go out and get out of the entity and yeah. I'm curious, like, what your take is on that, like, in that venture fund approach versus big R&D innovation lab model. 
I, I, I like it. I don't know how honest I should be about venture, venture capital. Um, I'm not a huge fan of venture capital. A lot of times I've just been on some bad, bad ends of, of venture capital uh, a few times. Uh, but I, the idea of like the first time that we, I was playing with the lab was as a similar type concept. And, and I was actually trying to stand up a lab internally, but I think having a partnership with a big company is, is, is really beneficial. Having access to their resources is, is really beneficial because you know, anybody who goes out and, and starts something, you need resources, whether that's people resources, financial resources. I think it's a really interesting and and I I I would love the idea of a model where the company has a little bit of an ownership in this thing that they spin out. You know, whether that's yeah. 10%, 20%, 50%, who knows? You know, whatever's fair and makes sense. I think there's a lot to be said for that, especially in, in industries that, you know, we talked a little bit just about kind of the innovators dilemma where they can't kill the cash cow. It just, it just, yeah. it's not, they yeah. can't, they're never going to get it past the board. Or even gonna... threaten it, you know, it's right. like, it's just right. a non-starter, right? Like yeah. You can, and... you can grow a new thing, but you can't kill the old thing. And even if the new thing starts eating into the old thing, that can also be problematic. So, yeah. And that's why I, I think it's a cool concept of what you're talking about. And I really like the idea of if you come up with a new way or a new innovation that might kill the cash cow, to be able to spin that out and and run it as an outside entity, as an outside organization without all those politics, but still having the company has some upside in, in your success. I, I think that that makes a ton of sense.